And I'm here with Joe Booth, VP of Sales Ops at Secure Auth. Joe, how are we doing today? Doing good, Jim. Thanks for having me. Yeah, totally appreciate you kicking off with us. Uh, tell me a little bit about just your, your group and a little bit about Secure Auth. Sure. So Secure Auth's been around since 2005. We're in the cybersecurity space, which is a very broad category of the software industry. And we are focused on identity access management. Uh, we protect remote workforces, which can be internal employees, contractors, partners, and also customers of those companies. So I think the easiest way to describe what we do is to just hold up my cell phone for a moment. <laughs> so right now, everybody is getting used to this, uh, this new system of what we call multi-factor authentication. You know how when you try and log on to a website, it sure. sends your phone now, it sends you a, a one-time passcode that you would then enter in and then it validates that you either are who you are or some sort of uh, former credentials. So that's the space that we're in, IAM, Identity Access Management. So there's a ton of behind the scenes technology that goes on to make sure that you are the right person that you say you are, that you have the telephone, that it's not the stolen device, uh, yep. that's not stolen credentials. So that IAM space really hot, not only for consumers, but also for internal workforces. And that's what we do. Love it. I use it all the time, <laughs> getting those pings. What I wanted to go deep on today, Joe, with you is really something we haven't done before, where we're going to look at the data specifically in the security segment and what we're seeing in terms of change sales processes and just the signals out there. So we'll go through kind of urgency and sort of how sales has changed and what the data is showing us. And then just love to get your thoughts on uh, the impacts to your team and how you've changed the motions and coaching and, and some of those areas. Sound good? Yeah, that sounds great. So we'll, we'll jump in on the signals and uh, of urgency and sort of the fast responses we've seen in security. I'm curious, when, when, when you think about the whole workforce moving remote, what, what strains has this put on uh, uh, you know, companies from a security perspective? A complete vulnerability. If companies did not already have the necessary provisions, then they were exposed at a scale that they never have been at before. And I think this was a wake up call for a lot of executives that had either been ignoring their CIOs or ignoring their chief information security officers for years. Uh, we always hear about breaches. We always hear about another company getting popped. And the people that are on the front line of that, the security analysts, the security professionals within these companies, uh, they know these threats are very real. It's not only your company's brand reputation, but it's also a lot of revenue that's asked, that, at, that is at risk. So the wake up call for the industry has been to take this seriously, get on top of it and not be a laggard when it comes to protecting your internal operations. And the perimeter has gotten so much wider because it's not just about the internal devices, the hardware that's running behind your walls. Now it is really everybody has a device or what we refer to as an endpoint that can be at risk. So being able to protect that, the sense of urgency has just gone through the roof. And yeah. I'm really happy with the way the team at Secure has been able to provide that responsiveness to the companies that we work for. Well, the, the data shows it. So, it, you know, there's a couple of different data points here, but one thing that we, we've been looking at is just overall meeting volume across all segments. And that's what's on the bottom here in the, in the brighter blue. So, We've shared this before, but overall, and if we look at the, the last week at 4th of July, so you see a big tip in productivity with the holiday. But overall, meetings have been down about 8% since before we shifted to sort of a full work at home environment. But in the above area, we're looking specifically at the security segment where it's up 26%, you know, quarter over quarter. Um, what's, what's going on here? Well, this is that sense of urgency that we talked about. The security professionals have been saying it for years, and now the executives and the CFOs are finally opening up the, the, the strings to the purse and saying, yeah, go buy what you need to make sure that we are protected. And this surge of people going from in office to working at home, companies m maybe being not as prepared as they should have been, or they were prepared, but now they just have to scale it out. So we're seeing a lot of adding licenses, a lot of from our existing customers and a lot of new customers coming on and needing to do very quick proof of concepts and then be able to get things up and running. So yeah, ever since everything happened in that mid-March time period, we've certainly seen a surge, especially from that first month or two months. We're having a tremendous amount of inbound leads coming in through the website, 
uh, we were running campaigns. So we had to enable our salespeople to be able to quickly transition to make sure that we could accelerate the deal cycle and, and match the pace of the demand that we were seeing from our customers. So yeah, I really like this graph because it shows how that surge has been progressively going up. And of course, we're going to you know, drop off as we get to this holiday week. But yeah, absolutely. We felt that pop and we had to react to it. Yeah, it's interesting if you look at the early part of Q1 and just the, the, the noticeable shift in productivity in, in this category. I mean, and, and the, the way it's held up and even built up towards the end of Q2, even 4th of July, it doesn't look like much, much of a delta compared to the rest of the industry. Um, but it's remarkable that it, it, it's, it's held steady. I wanted to get your perspective also on deal progression. So in the security segment specifically, we saw a 45% increase in deals progressing to the next stage from February to March. I mean, very significant pop. Does this match? What did you see as you were closing out Q1 and getting into the start of Q2? Yeah, we had a great Q2. I and mean, we we're really fortunate to be working in an industry that addresses the pain point for these companies of trying to scale out their remote workforce and protect their customers as well. And we felt that surge. Uh, and, and right now it's about market share. So every, like you, the battle between Microsoft and Teams and Zoom and all these other companies that are trying to enable the remote workforce, that's what's going on. You're seeing a lot of free licenses right now, promotional periods, all of these. And we jumped right on that bandwagon. We wanted to make sure that people had access to the security that they needed for the entire year without having to pay a dime. And then come the end of the year, if they want to renew and sign a contract, one to three year contract, then we, you know, we have an option for that. Uh, but the nice thing is when you think about the deal progression is uh, two things happened to us. We had a surge of net new opportunities, right? When all of this started yeah. popping off. But some of our customers and prospects in industries that were hit harder, like travel and hospitality, those deals just went away. Mm -hmm. So we had to backfill with these net new opportunities. So there was a, a little bit of a balancing act there between late stage deals and the industries that were impacted and new opportunities for companies that were trying to ramp up from their work from home security situations. So tell me a little bit more about the free, you mentioned you did your, a free license program. I'm curious how that's been working. And, and now that we're a little bit later in the, in the process, what are you seeing from that? Yeah, it's worked well. So the interesting thing about security professionals is by nature, uh, they can be skeptical and uh, cautious. You don't want to move too fast. So anytime you hear something about free for a certain time period, you really have to vet it mm -hmm. regardless of how much it costs. And, and that's the due diligence that a company has to do. Uh, but So it was for us an opportunity to get our foot in the door with a lot of companies that we had existing conversations going with that needed now something a little bit more compelling because as they saw their budgets shrink for this year, then they, but they still need to have that security. We were able to, pro, able to provide them with an option for that. So, Hey, protect your business free of cost for this year. Let's get through this year together. We're going to support you. And then yeah. next year, if it makes sense, we'll do that. So yeah, that helped with, uh, fill some of the hole that we had from other deals that dropped out and it, and it forced us to adapt as a sales ops team as well with the way that we were provisioning licenses, the way that we we're doing our contracts, uh, all of that. So yeah, it took some buy-in and some huddles, but we made it work. Yeah, Joe, we, we've been looking at payment terms uh, for a while now and just the impact, especially immediately in kind of the March time period, we saw a decrease in net 30 payment terms as companies were being more flexible what we've seen now is it's bounced back up. So we saw that, you know, net 30 was it dropped to 56% from 77. Now it's back up to 70%. But I'd love to get a sense of as you're closing out, you said that you had a strong Q2, sort of what you're seeing and kind of how the deals have changed, how, how that final contract has changed. Yeah, we're tr traditionally in the enterprise software space, net 30 is the standard. So for most companies that we're working with, this is business as usual uh, for the companies that took advantage of our free licenses through the end of the year. Uh, they did not obviously have to worry about payment terms. And I'm really fortunate. Our CFO, fantastic. Everybody on our finance team is great. And also our general counsel is fantastic as well. So they were able to quickly just agree like saying, Hey, we need to do what just makes sense. Mm -hmm. We have to act on good faith during these hard times. Like 
as a country, as a people, as a culture, a society, this is when things get rough, we come together, right? And we had to take that same position. Yes, it's about grabbing market share right now. Yes, it's about capturing future customers and, and, and helping existing customers that we have today. But at the end of the day, we want to get deals done so companies can be protected. So we have that good faith moving forward when it comes to that cross sell up sell opportunity to that renewal period, all of the things that are necessary for a business to continue to be around over the next several years. Joe, with the influx of demand, how did you address that, that sense of urgency? I mean, it's a very short window that, that you probably had to reinvent some of the sales process. Yeah, it, I would say it wasn't so much about reinvention as it was about hurrying the heck up, like making sure that people were not dilly-dallying at all. Like, so you think about your typical sales cycle where you, you have your qualification meeting, there's a certain level of discovery that happens, there's this prove stage, and then you get to that negotiate period. For the business that we're in, an enterprise software deal can be six to nine months in length. That's our standard. But during these crazy times, we were seeing this happening over the course of a few weeks. So we had to really make sure that we had the bandwidth internally to get things done. So yeah, a lot of late nights, uh, our sales engineers were working overtime to make sure that they were giving demos. Uh, our account executives were having to move at a much faster clip when it comes to scheduling meetings, follow-up meetings uh, with their internal people. So this was really about deal velocity and, and not so much around trying to reinvent, but rather just speed up. When you, sp when you think about, you know, you talk about the late nights and the, and the expansion, one of the data points that we were sharing last week is around how the percentage of meetings that start before 9 a.m. has increased. So we're seeing an influx on that. And the bigger change is that the percentage of, and these are typically external meetings that we're tracking. So client facing meetings after 4 p.m. has increased significantly up 121% since January. What, how is your team working now that we're not traveling? What does your day look like? Well, it's very similar to this. Uh, we're the, I guess the, the thing about this slide is if I were a smart sales rep, I would definitely want to be on the left side of this column when it comes to when I'm setting up my meetings. Because if you think about the, what, the situation that we're all in, the workday has been expanded. right? Eight-hour days, nine-hour days are really a thing of the past. Now it's 10, 11, 11 or just ongoing Zoom sessions for teams like ours that are international. We, biz, we, we run our business around the clock. So if you're a smart sales rep or a sales leader and you're looking at this slide, what I would encourage you to do is make sure that your team is having the meetings in the morning. You do not wanna be the sales guy giving a product demonstration after four o'clock in the afternoon when the attention span and the energy of your prospect is completely zapped. But yeah, absolutely. We've seen this. We've got earlier meetings happening. We have later meetings going on in the day. Uh, we are encouraging our sales reps to do a lot more prospecting after hours. In fact, we have uh, a five for five campaign mm -hmm. right now that we're saying, hey, pick up the phone after five o'clock and make sure that you're making five dials to your top accounts. So we're encouraging them to put in the later hours as well. And it's paying off. You know, We want to make sure that we're going into Q3 with uh, continuing to build strong pipeline and and build off the momentum that we built in Q2 and not just ride that little surge, but use that surge to really send us into yeah. more higher space in the next few quarters. I think it's a, it's a great observation here. I think you're right. We're all seeing the days get longer. We're not commuting. We're filling that time. The mornings maybe are being a bit more protected and there's room there to, to, to you know, get people in the commute windows that they used to have as well. One of the other aspects I wanted to get is just supporting our teams through this. So one of the data points that's interesting near and dear to our hearts is just around coaching. So we can't, we can't see our teams. We can't be out in the field with them. So how do we onboard or how do we coach? And what we're finding is that teams are coaching their team members 21% more than they were even before the work at home uh, you know, shift. Um, how are you coaching your team? How are you onboarding people right now? You know, I, I love this slide. I love what it represents that managers are getting more involved with their teams. You know, there's two sides. I've seen two types of sales reps out there, sales managers out there. The people that are great coaches that love to coach, love to motivate and are good at helping lift up their teams. And then there's the, co there's, there's the managers that were really good sales reps, but never really learned how to be sales managers. And, and they usually don't last very long in those roles. But what I like about this slide of what it represents of 
managers are getting more involved with their teams to help raise them up to that next level because anybody that's in any type of leadership role values that. And that's really what this slide is showing is that more managers are taking interest in their team. And we've seen that exact same thing here at SecureAuth. In fact, we did our entire sales, uh, sales kickoff planning a few weeks ago in Scottsdale, Arizona, and we all got together and it was a little bit risky to do that, uh, but we did. And what we found is that we had a lot more observable data that we had coming into that sales kickoff planning session than we had in the past because managers are so much more involved in their deals. Yeah. What we were able to do is then take that information and plan a great virtual second half sales kickoff, which is going on next week. And really it's been focused on early sales stage execution, uh, deal velocity and prospecting. And because the managers are more involved in their deals now, they're able to spot the areas of opportunity that we have to train up the team. So I love this slide because it really shows that if you get more involved with your teams, you're going to have those areas of opportunity to help them get better. And at the end yeah. of the day, that's what we all want to do. And I think the precision, like even on the left here, Bruce, when you think about the uh, becoming more data driven on coaching is one of the areas that I'm excited to see the shift. So it's a little less of the feeling, the energy, listening, you know, to partial calls. And it's, it's more precise. You know, are we advancing deals? Are we having the right talk times? Are we you know, multi-threading? So we'll see, we'll see where this continues to go, but it's an exciting you know, change in the way uh, sales leadership's working with their, with their team members. And one last data point is just the participation of sales leadership. And now this data point is specifically looking at the security segment where we saw a big pop from February to March. It's dropped a little bit, but overall, it's a, it, the change is only 12% since kind of pre work from home, pre COVID. And in other categories, we see a much bigger, you know, Delta where it's you know, 60, 70% increase. Um, how, how involved do leadership get in security and how has that changed in the last quarter? You know, we've been really fortunate. We have a culture of executive alignment and executive sponsorship programs. So for us, we haven't really seen our leadership get that much more involved than we have in the past because they've always been very hands-on. It's yeah. part of the value prop that we have. It's part of our uh, culture of partnership and building trust with our customers is to have that executive alignment. Once we have a qualified opportunity and it gets in the discover stage, we want to make sure that we have an executive assigned to that account and that they're really riding shotgun with the uh, account executive as it progresses. So for us, we haven't really felt this level of impact, but I can certainly see how other industries uh, would have or other companies even in the security space if they hadn't already had such a tightly knit executive sponsorship program um, because executives aren't flying around. They're not in as many meetings uh, that there have to be in person for so they can hop maybe 10, 15 minutes on a call, then drop off and maybe spread themselves out at a greater clip than they would prior to being able to do that remotely. So yeah, yeah, it's an interesting slide. For us, it's not as relevant because our executive team has always been really involved in the deals. Uh, it's, been, it's helped us from a sales standpoint. But yeah, this is probably a, a, an opportunity for somebody that does not have an, a solid executive sponsorship program to learn uh, from those uh, mistakes yeah. of the past and be able to get more involved. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge validation for the security segment that this was already happening <laughs> yeah, compared to other spaces and maybe the higher velocity sales where we weren't typically seeing this, but um, you know, that, that's fantastic. And maybe this final closing thoughts, Joe, what, what's your outlook for Q3? I think Q3 is going to be great. I think that Q3 will be better in 2020 than it was in 2019, not just for us as a company, but overall. Uh, I know that the economy is struggling right now. It's certainly on the upswing. But historically, when you think about Q3, and we've all experienced this, people are on summer break. People are on going on vacation. They're traveling. Uh, they're taking their kids to Disney World or the local theme parks. They're going on the European vacation. None of that's going to be happening right now which means decision makers and teams are gonna be at home working, getting business done. So the excuse that the economic buyer uh, is not available on such and such date because he's taken the kids to uh, you know, Prague for three yeah. weeks, those days are not gonna be happening. Q3 is gonna be strong if you execute as a unit. And I think this is gonna be a great one. I love it, super, super optimistic. I couldn't agree more. There's nowhere to go, nothing to do. It's work. <laughs> 
work earlier, work later, as the data shows. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Hey, Joe, I appreciate you joining us today. We put a lot of this data up on chorus.ai. People can just go to our resources page and click on weekly briefing to um, access this. But thanks for kicking off the day. Hope Happy you, to hope, do it, Jim. Great, great way to start the morning. Likewise, likewise. Thanks.